another vlog. This is Rocky and Bullwinkle 2018, uh, episodes 1 and 2. Stink of Fear chapters 1 and 2. Commission vlog for uh, Nick Borovic. Thanks as always for backing, Nick. Um, so, before I get started, I should talk a little bit about uh, what I know, you know, my relationship with Rocky and Bullwinkle, which is essentially none. Um, I've watched little to none of it. Uh, it really just wasn't... I don't remember if it just wasn't on when I was a kid or in, you know, the area I grew up in, or if I just had other things I watched instead or what, but I never really watched it. Um, but it's, you know, basically impossible to be into animation and not encounter Rocky and Bullwinkle and learn the basics out of osmosis. It's not exactly a complicated topic. Um, and this episode seems to fit into it, or these two episodes seem to more or less fit into it. Um, there's less... Segmenting, um, Rocky and Bullwinkle was, uh, always divided up into segments with, you know, stuff happening in between them, uh, like, segments with different groups of characters, that kind of thing, to my understanding. Um, it's not really a thing here. Uh, the closest we get is the commercial non-breaks. Uh, the best way, is the best way I can put it. They're clearly making fun of the fact that, you know, this is an Amazon Prime show. There are no commercials, uh, but the structure of Rocky and Bullwinkle is built around this idea of, oh, time for a cliffhanger ahead of the commercial break. And so instead they do these very silly cutaways that are brief visual puns on the various phrases used to introduce commercial breaks. Um, which is cute, and more or less in keeping with the aesthetic of the show, which is very, you know, irreverent, silly, nonsensical, uh, slapstick-heavy. It's in many ways a throwback to, well, cartoons of the 60s and 70s, uh, when you know, the original Rocky and Bullwinkle was made. You've got the, you know, sinister Eastern European spies and the general Cold War vibe that comes with that. You've got, you know, the odd couple pairing um, of... Rocky and Bullwinkle themselves. Rocky at this point doesn't have much of a character. He's pretty generic sidekick. And Bullwinkle is fairly typical, not very bright, um, but can survive anything uh, cartoon protagonist. Um, there are some distinct differences from cartoons of the 60s and 70s, though, in that there's the general air of irreverence extends to everything. It's not just uh, contained into safe subjects, so to speak, which, as cartoons developed, in through the dark ages of the 60s and 70s, uh, because those really were the dark ages of American animation, uh, they played it very safe. Um, and this show to an extent still does by modern standards, but by standards of the time, you know, making fun of airport security is a kind of irreverence toward established authority that you don't see much in. You see lots of it in cartoons of the 40s and 50s, but you, 
starts to fade out into the 60s and 70s. Um, and you, you know, like with the TSA jokes here, um, which, I mean, that is a great way to immediately get on my good side, is to make fun of security theater, because uh, security theater is nonsense. Um, so, you know, the jokes about, you know, the, the silly pun about profiling, but even more so, like, how bumbling Natasha and Boris, of course, are, and Rocky saying, well, I feel more secure. Um, that pretty much sums it up. Um, so, that kind, of, that kind of thing is not something you saw a ton of, to my knowledge, in cartoons of the 70s in particular and 80s, um, with, with this, so it's nice to see that injected into something that's otherwise very aesthetically close to them. Uh, at the same time, it's also got a strong aesthetic kinship to the cartoons of like the late 90s. Um, it's got the same, um, heavily John Kay influenced, uh, kind of aesthetic that you saw a lot of in, like, Nickelodeon in the late 90s. Um, there's Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network. Uh, there's definitely influ influences there, too. The, the Natasha very clearly has the Hartman hips that characterized a lot of female character designs in stuff like Powerpuff Girls and um, uh, Dexter's Lab and that kind of thing. Um, the kind of silliness of it, the, the energetic silliness that's basically there for pointless nonsense, there is a very kind of Teen Titans Go vibe, uh, which I know is a show that gets a lot of flack from people, but honestly, I think it's fun. And I think it's good that there's a kid's show that is just fluff. And I think this kind of falls into that same category. This is fluff. It's entertaining and silly and fast-paced and doesn't really do anything. It's got no particular ambitions. It's... Brain, you know, it's it's brain candy for kids. And you know what? Kids deserve to get a little candy from time to time. It's not going to kill them. <coughs> that said, the distinctly Cold War concerns of, like, the rogue Eastern European nation that wants, you know, the doomsday device to conquer the world, that's a very, well, Cold War kind of attitude, and it's not something you really see in modern cartoons very much, because Cold War's been over a long time. The Cold War's been old enough, been over long enough, that people born after it ended are old enough to be show-running cartoons. Um, you know, uh, because somebody born after the, well, okay, not quite, actually, you know, yes, somebody born in, uh, immediately after the Cold War ended would be about 30 now. That's old enough to be a young creator. That's, I think, older than Bright were when they started Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, and the people who are making the big cartoons now, you know, um, Rebecca Sugar and Ian Qu jones Cordy are both, I think, slightly younger than me, which means they were early, in early elementary school when the Cold War ended. Um, that's, 
it doesn't, it's not something that holds a lot of meaning for modern creators, and so they're not really building their cartoons around that sort of concept. Um, instead, what you see is a lot of rebelling against oppressive authority because that's much more what we live in now. There's really only one global superpower, and we live in it. So, what else? You know, that's kind of what you end up writing about. As opposed to when there was conflict between two, um, the idea of engaging with a foreign menace was a lot more in the air, uh, particularly the, the idea of like the infiltrating spies, which is a very Cold War paranoia kind of thing. So it's an interesting chunk of like 45 year old politics because the, you know, the show is taking these elements from its past incarnation 40 years ago and bringing them into the present without examining them, we get this really weird thing where we're getting unexamined politics, but they're not exactly our unexamined politics. They're our parents, grandparents even in some cases, unexamined politics. And that's an odd thing to try to engage with. Uh, because What does it mean to be talking about Cold War concerns in, with kids in 2018, uh, which is when this came out? I honestly am not entirely sure. Uh, but it's an interesting question, and if Nick decides to commission more of this, one I will explore further as I explore more of the series. Right now, um, the Stink of Fear story is barely begun. I'm two episodes in out of, I think, five, because I think it's doing the, like, 80s standard five-episode multi-part introduction. I'm not exactly sure that there's enough going on in Rocky and Bullwinkle to need it, but maybe that's a joke. I don't know. Um, I think that's about it. Hope y'all enjoyed that. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Check out my Patreon for early access to vlogs, essays, let's plays, and more. And I'll see you all next time. Bye!